You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 64, The Passion of Frank Spear. In this Dental Guys exclusive interview with Dr. Frank Spear, we find out how his early life and education molded his style of communication and how he's able to blend what we know about people and what we know about dentistry to help patients choose our best dentistry. Dr. Spear reveals how figures in his life were able to set expectations of excellence, which guided him towards always wanting to be the best, but also to realize there is always more to learn. Did we discover that case acceptance is really just great storytelling? This week on The Dental Guys. This episode of The Dental Guys is brought to you by the Dental Crafters Network, your implant restorative connection. From surgical planning to patient-specific guides, quality implants, and final restorations, the Dental Crafters Network provides one relationship with infinite possibilities. Call 1-800-472-8302 today. That's 1-800-472-8302. And by Restorative Driven Implants. Understand, place, restore, and implement dental implant treatment from John and Wes, the dental guys. Go to restorativedrivenimplants.com right now to sign up for the next series of courses and take your implant education to the next level. And welcome to this week's episode of the dental guys. I'm Wes, the dental guy. And I'm John, the dental guy. Man. Okay, so <laughs> you just read you the saw, show title. If you saw the title, you know what this is. And I mean, you know, for what in the world, John? We started this podcast <sighs> almost three years ago in July of 2018. In 2015, I think was when we started recording July or August yeah. and released something in October. Yeah, it's been about three years. It's been about three years. And I just want to say that we are super humbled to be able to bring to the dental guys one of the greatest minds um, in all of dentistry john yeah and and one of the biggest influencers uh uh, not only of of our career but really of kind of a a multiple generations yeah i think it's interesting yeah that's the that that frank spear who we're about to have you know this interview role in just a minute um you know, in, in this interview, you hear him talk about the fact that you know, he's been doing this a long time, and yet he mentioned the fact that in his latest workshops that he's sitting in on, that more of his dentists than ever are young dentists. And so there, Spear has had an influence, Frank Spear has had an influence going back to the days of, you know, the 70s and 80s and 90s. <clears throat> where, the culture where really, has shifted from... Yeah where he was teaching people that were 10 to 15 years out of dental school. Right. Now he's seeing more people that are one to five years out of dental school in his courses. Yeah. So, I mean, you're talking about a multi-generational influence in dentistry and, and yet so many things have, have remained the same. And, you know, we were, we were uh, pretty excited about this because he, you know, Dr. Spear, he's never done, I almost hate to call him Frank, you know, I mean, it's like, I know yeah. it's, he's just a guy, but uh, he's never done a podcast interview before, really doesn't do any interviews. Yeah, he doesn't speak he, outside of Spear Education, I really don't think any. No, except now. major meetings like the major AO. Me- yeah. Like the, like, that was, we saw him a couple of years ago at the AO, which was an amazing talk that he gave. And <clears throat> so, you know, he's not really, that's not his life right now does have a book out, which we're going to talk some about mm-hmm. uh, in the show uh, as far as uh, what that's all about. I don't want to I don't want to blow that too quick, but I, we'll talk about that. But this is not an infomercial. No. I mean, in we fact, there's it's no... not like it's not like somebody called us up from Spear and said, you know, we want to have Frank on there so he can talk about his book. In fact, the first thing he said when we like started talking before the interviews, he goes, you know, guys, I mean, this really isn't about the book. You know, I just let's talk. And it, it, maybe that comes up. But this is about, you know, just let's let's see how this interview flows because he's passionate and you you see it come out. Yeah, it's great. about how he feels. I, I love what he said at one point in this interview. He said, you know, if you if you have a, a genuine respect and and kind of a if treatment plans are based on your your love for your for your job, your love for the patient, 
it all kind of works out in the end if you just have an idea of, of kind of how to frame things for your patient. And I mean, Wes, what kind of, I mean, I just want you to talk just for a few seconds about you know, how has your treatment planning changed as a result of uh, Dr. Spears' influence on you? I think, you know, the thing that's hard to, you know, really get used to whenever you start practicing, there's many young dentists that are listening to this show, is how do you begin to present, you know, complex dental care once you understand complex dental care? Like once you understand right. the science and how to do it, that's one thing right. you have you to You got to have the clinical knowledge. You got to have the clinical knowledge. But the thing that John and I and my for myself, when we really decided that we wanted to dive in to spear education and the first course that that we really took was a workshop and we've taken seminars and things and, and local study clubs, but actually going to the campus and hearing Gary DeWood and facially generated treatment planning, the very first lecture we heard was not about clinical dentistry. Right. It was about you yeah, and why. Why are you, why, why are you doing your this? Why? Why are you here? And I think that's for every dentist, John. This is what this is what it helped me. It's what helped me is that it helped me to begin to establish. Hey, really, why am I here? Yeah. Why am I doing this? And, and, and to be honest with you, you have to have that in your practice. You have to have a why. Why are you showing up to work today? And I tell you what, I, I understand my why, John, a lot better now because of what I've learned at Spear Education. And yeah, really, I think they've they've really focused me as well on that. And it's a focus. It's really, it is. It's, and, and, it, and you really craft your whole practice around that because if you... If you understand, because I don't think a lot of people understand really why they're doing what they're doing in their practice. They're just kind of on a on a hamster wheel, and uh, they know they need the clinical training, but they don't even really know where they're trying to get to. Right. And once you know where you're trying to get to, um, then all of a sudden, these things start to, all the puzzle pieces that are missing right. start to become visible to you. You start right. to go, okay, so here's what I need to know more about, and that might not have anything to do with clinical dentistry. It might have to do with, you know, your team or your personality or how you need to talk mm. to patients better, or it may be your veneer preps, you know, it may be a little bit of everything. And I think that that's really been a, this conversation that we had with Dr. Spear was amazing <clears throat> and we're just yeah. going to go right ahead and get right into it. I just want to thank Dr. Spear for joining us for this time. Yep. And also and Ben and, uh, and Ben Jen and Jen really Spear shout Education. out to those guys over there at Spear Education for putting this together for, for us. And uh, thank you so much and enjoy. And welcome to uh, this interview. Uh, we're pretty excited about this, as you guys can imagine, because John, we have, how excited oh, are you? <laughs> pretty excited. Pretty excited. Uh, Dr. Frank Spear is here with us. That's right. You, you heard that correctly and uh, uh we know that you know dr spear is he's a guy just like uh you know, we are <laughs> he he's just his, a guy he, he but, does what we do right dentistry but, <laughs> but you know uh obviously we know that you know he's uh he, he holds a special place in a lot of our mm. uh, our careers because of some of the things that he's taught us and uh and we're very very excited to get to uh to speak with you today dr spear thank you so much for being on the show with us today it's uh, my pleasure john and west looking forward to it well, one of the things that uh, I want to get, I want to dive right into this. I want to, you know, use our time as wisely as we can. Um, we, we really, you know, Wes and I went through a lot of discussion about what we wanted to, to, to ask you because there's so many things that we could go. And we really, we, you know, we talk a lot on our show about clinical dentistry and about research-based dentistry um, and all that stuff's awesome. And we've really geeked out with a lot of the other Spear faculty about that. But we felt that maybe for this interview, that it would be even more appropriate to focus on some of the areas that, that we know that you're passionate about, which is treatment acceptance, case presentation. Um, but we wanted to maybe go back because Wes and I talk a lot about mentorship and we talk a lot about how do we learn to be the kind of dentist that we, that we want to be. And I'm interested to know in your, you know in your career when you were starting out, when did you feel that you understood enough about clinical dentistry to begin focusing on the more complex treatment plans? I guess what I wonder is, did this happen in your residency where you got the kind of training to start talking about complex dentistry clinically and also 
who were some of the greatest influencers on you as far as your clinical knowledge? Um, yeah, I actually, and for me, I, I enjoy going back and, and looking back at some of the stories about how I ended up doing what I've done. Um, first of all, just a little, little background history on me. I, I came from a really small town, so a farming community about an hour south of Seattle, 1,500 people. Um, my mom was a school teacher, second grade. My dad was a mechanic. Uh, they grew up in the same exact town. And so I literally graduated 30 years after them from the same exact buildings that they graduated from. I love it. Um, and I went to work for my dad in his gas station and garage when I was, I think, 13. Um, and I didn't really have any clue because there's, in our town, there's one dentist and there was one physician. And in the neighboring towns, there weren't any dentists or physicians. And so the two neighboring towns didn't have a junior high or high school either. So their kids would all come to our school. And so my class was about 100 kids, but it was from three towns put together to get to the 100. And for me, I, I liked sports and I liked cars and like had a girlfriend. And I never, never honestly looked. I viewed the professionals, the dentist and the physician in our town as just being at a different level than I could ever be because um, people like me and our family, they just didn't do that. But my parents were really big in education, um, so they really wanted me to go to college. And, in, and you know, I'll make it a short story. In 1970, I, uh, they said, where are you going to go to college? And I said, well, I don't know. And they said, well, you got to pick because you have to apply. And uh, don't want to embarrass myself too much, but uh, Playboy magazine on the cover of the local newsstand in 1970 <laughs> had an article that said, Chico State, California, number one party school in America. And I, <laughs> I knew I wanted to play football in college, and I wasn't that big, but I could play at a small college level, and Chico State was that size. And so awesome. I, went, I went home to my parents, and I said, I'm going to go to Chico State, California. And they never asked why. Oh man! Oh and, man! Uh, this is not story. how I expected this uh, this question to go, <laughs> no. but I, but this is excellent. So, this makes, uh, this so I'm going to get to the mentorship and dentistry <laughs> part, but I, right, the story of how I ended up in dentistry is sort of a bigger mentorship role, believe it or not. Yeah. Mm. And uh, so I applied to Chico State, California. It's the only college I applied to. I didn't get accepted. Mm. You know, I hadn't done well in high school. I just I could do it. I just didn't care. I was interested in sports and other things. And uh, so since I didn't get in, they said, well, you know, you, you're going to go to college because we went to college. You're going to college. Why don't you go where we went? And they went to a small college called Pacific Lutheran University that's 20 minutes from where I grew up. And I was thinking, wow, that does not sound like a party school at all, Pacific Lutheran <laughs> University. Um, but, but I applied there and I got in. So I went there and I, I literally tried my best my freshman year to turn Pacific Lutheran into Chico State, California. <laughs> and uh, nice. I, I literally finished with a 2.3 GPA and a D in a religion class. Oh, and uh, oh, my parents were freaked out because it was a private school and they didn't make a lot of money. And I was their only kid. And they said, look, you, you got you to gotta step it up if you're going to go back there next year. You got to pick a major. Well, I was having a great time playing football, and, and all of my buddies on the football team, they were all phys ed majors. They were going to be coaches. So I declared phys ed as my major. And to declare phys ed as a major meant you had to take anatomy and physiology. Those were the two hard classes. So my football teammates, they all put them off. And I thought, well, that's really stupid. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it now and get it over with, and then I can just cruise. And so my sophomore year, I took anatomy, and I had this really passionate instructor named Ruth Sorensen, and she'd had polio as a child. And uh, so she had arm braces and leg braces, and, and I loved anatomy. And at the end of the semester, she says to me, you know, after finals next week, I'd like to meet with you. Um, and I thought, wow, I think I've done well. I don't know why she wants to meet with me. The only person ever wanted to meet with me was the religion professor. And that was because he couldn't tell whether he should give me a D or an F. <laughs> and uh, so after finals, and this, this is my first answer to your mentor question. So after finals, 
I in, go into her office, and she sits across the desk from me, and she looks at me, and she says, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Whoa. And I said, I'm going to be a coach. She says, yeah, that's what I thought. She says, what else you thought about? Nothing. She said, you ever think about being a physician? Nope. Dentist? Nope. Veterinarian? Nope. Physical therapist? Nope. She says, well, I think you should, because I think you're way more capable than you think you are. And she said, so I've set up a meeting for you and I. And she got up, and we walked down the hall of the science building. And we turned in to the pre-med, pre-dent advisor's office, a man named Harold Laris. He was in his 70s. Harold Laris was a dentist. And Ruth Sorensen and I and Harold Laris sat across the desk from each other. And 15 minutes later, I decided to be a dentist. Wow. 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 And from that day forward, I was passionate and driven. I got one B, I think, in a lab the rest of my time at PLU. And then when it came time to apply to dental school, I still had the belief that everybody else who was going to be in dental school was better than me. They probably came from professional families. They'd known they wanted to be a dentist their whole life. So I went into dental school thinking, man, I'm going to, I applied to like 12 or 15 schools because I just assumed nobody would take me. Um, and sure enough, I got into the University of Washington, which is where I wanted to go. And then once I got there, um, you know, a huge mentor, believe it or not, became my senior dental student. We had at, at Washington at the time, we used to have a thing called vertical groups. And what a vertical group was is you had a senior, a fourth year, third year, second year, first year dental student, and an advisor. And the, the, you had weekly meetings, and they were there to help you, um, you know, with whatever your struggles and anxieties were. Well, my senior dental student... Um, was Dick Tucker Jr. I don't know if you know Dick Tucker Sr. was just a legend in gold inlays and onlays and his Tucker study clubs. And, yeah, yeah. and he had influenced Dick Jr. so profoundly. And Dick Jr., just such a, a nurturing guy. And so I didn't know much about dentistry at all because obviously I didn't decide to do it until Ruth Sorensen had that meeting. And so what I would do is I would literally get done with a class, and if I had a free hour, I would just go find Dick Jr. And if he was treating patients, I'd just sit and watch him. Or if he was in the lab doing lab work, I'd watch him. And then I started realizing that I got issued a deniform and I got issued a handpiece, and I would literally take my deniform as a freshman dental student, and I would look at what he did in the patient's mouth, and then I'd go try and prep the tooth to look like his. And then I'd sit in the lab with him, and I would wax up that deniform tooth, invest it, cast it, try and finish it. And, and it, he was a profound influence on me about what excellent dentistry looked like, because I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't know about dentistry, really. And so my, my first two mentors occurred long before I ever got out of dental school, and it really was. It was Ruth Sorensen and then Dick Tucker, Jr., and then regarding, you know, I, um, my parents were really passionate, as I said, about education. And I put myself through college doing photography um, for an interior decorator. I would go shoot houses and buildings. And I had taught my, taken photography classes in college, but I taught myself how to color print back then. And so I would then go back, photograph them after they were done, and, and put these books together to show before and afters. Well, I started photographing everything in dental school when I was a freshman. So I would photograph Dick Tucker Jr.'s models and his inlays, and I'd photograph my deniform stuff. And I started putting together little presents my second year in dental school to show my classmates <clears throat> what, what Dick was doing. Um, hmm. And so by the time I was a junior, I actually did my first presentation to the State Dental Association. It was the table clinic on amalgam carving. And... Um, so I just, was, I just was always passionate about trying to really, Ruth Sorensen to this day, I never go into a lecture without thinking, you know what, I could be a Ruth Sorensen for somebody in an audience today. That's right. I, I could truly help them see that they can do more than they believe they could do. Because that's mm -hmm. really what she did. 
And so I've tried to carry that with me throughout my educational career. Now, in terms of the clinical dentistry and the competence part, um, there was Washington at the time in the 70s was really a powerhouse in terms of its perioprost program. Washington, University of Penn, um, and BU, Boston were really the three major big powers in perioprost back then. And our director was a man named Ralph Udalis, and Ralph was amazing. He'd been through the Perio program and the PROS program, and then took over as the director of a combined Perio PROS program. But he had left a culture of excellence. So we only took two students a year, and the big deal was Ralph traveled all over the world and showed cases, and he showed students cases. Well, we all wanted to be the students who he showed. So it was all about, are, is your case good enough that Ralph will okay. show your case? And That's so awesome. it was a competition to see who could be the case that Ralph showed. So when I started that program, we used to have to do the entire perio curriculum, but we didn't have to do as many surgeries as the full perio students. And then we had to do all our fixed pros program curriculum. But what you did is he assigned you patients, and they were all full rehabs. And... You had to do all your own lab work. You couldn't send any lab work out. Um, you had to do some of the perio surgery yourself. You could have the perio grads work with some of it. You'd, obviously, endo and ortho was done outside. But you didn't graduate from the program until you finished the cases you got assigned your first year. So it's, you could mm. be there two years, three years, four years. We have people there over four years by the wow. time the cases got done. And so it was a seven-day-a-week job. It was literally... Since you're doing all your own lab work, it was, you were there seven days a week, Sundays you were there from eight or 10 in the morning till eight at night, because otherwise you couldn't get stuff done. Mm -hmm. So Ralph Udalis and, and a man named Bob Fauché, who was his assistant, were huge mentors of mine. And then we had an incredible perio program, and uh, Saul Schluger, who actually founded the perio program at Washington, he founded the first perio program in the United States, actually at Columbia in 1948. Um, and Bill Ammons, who was his chairman of Perio when I was there. Those guys had a massive influence on me. Um, and then, in terms of other mentors, really Vince Kokich and Dave Matthews in my study club that was uh, formed you know, back in 1983 um, by a general practitioner, Ralph O'Connor, put all of us together. And, and really, that study club and those guys were massive mentors to me, massive influences on me. So roundabout answer to your question. You know, I think I wrote four mm. words down as you were telling this amazing story. Mm. And the first word that I wrote down was someone set a different expectation. And Ruth Sorson set a different expectation for yourself that led to her leading you to someone that created accountability. That's my second word, mm -hmm. which led to what I heard was somebody that learned how to work hard, hard work, then led to someone that was dedicated. So expectation, accountability, leading to hard work and dedication. I mean, that's kind of, for me, kind of sums up what a mentor does for, you know, and a, you know, someone that's wanting to listen and learn. And we talk about this a lot on our show is where are the wannabes, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I want to be, you know, you've influenced us. I mean, I kind of mm -hmm. like, you know, you, you have in a big right. way. I right. mean, how I presented treatment today um, and how John presented treatment today. Uh, you have influenced us, and you've influenced thousands of dentists. It's probably will never be known how many influence, how many you've influenced. But these four words kind of stand out. John, speak to that just a minute. Yeah, you know, I think that it's interesting to hear that there was a culture of mm. excellence. You know, and I yeah. think that that is one of the things that <clears throat> you know we we have seen through advanced continuing education. It's interesting when. You know, Wes and I talk about the difference between going to specialty meetings and yes. going to GP-based meetings. Not you can't generalize everything, but there's there are some interesting differences we've found over the years as far as what's become a little bit more 
you know, maybe marketing based or, or practice management driven. Well, the culture is different. A culture of clinical excellence. And it sounds like that, that started earlier in your career through your residency, you know, not that you necessarily knew that that was coming, but that drive was there. And, you know, I, I look at today's, you know, new graduates and I, I think about that, um, you know, how do you, you know, taking that experience that you shared, how do you look, how, when, you, when you train new dentists today, especially uh, younger dentists, uh, what do you see as being different about the culture, if there is a difference? Uh, what do you see are some of the greatest needs uh, that you feel, you know, you, you, your organization is trying to meet uh, with, with the new graduates? Yeah, I think, um, and I'll go back and I'm going to answer it. You know, I've been, I've been involved in doing education. My first national lecture was in 1983 to the Chicago uh, Academy of Fixed Pros. And if I go back to the 80s and 90s, and I look at the people that would come to me for education in the 80s and 90s, most of the dentists who were coming to me had mm. been out 10 to 15 years. Many had been out much longer than that. But you didn't mm. see a lot of them that came out and came to the courses I was doing, let's say, five years out. Um, and, and the ones who came back in the 80s and 90s they came because they had gotten sick of the style of practice they had. Most of them were busy because there was a lot of patients back then. Um, but they were doing just tooth-based dentistry and they just were getting burned out. It wasn't fulfilling to them. And so I had this window of this very specific group of people. And then, of course, cosmetics came along also. And in the 90s, cosmetics exploded. And so then everybody suddenly wanted to add cosmetics into the window. What's interesting today, and I, I feel um, lucky in that we get, I don't know that, well, I don't want to say we don't get average, but we have a very unique situation in Scottsdale because we get a lot of young dentists today, um, way more than I ever had before. I mean, way more. Um, there were, there was a workshop, a uh, facially generated treatment planning workshop a couple months ago that I just set in on the introductions because I was curious to hear who was in the audience. And, and I think there were seven dentists there who had been out less than five years. And three of them had been out only two years. One had just gotten out. And they were, they were into it. Now, some of what I think happens is those people end up into it because they associated with somebody who already knew who we were and kind of what we were about, mm -hmm. or they were a child of a dentist who had already been involved right. with us. So who sent them over, For sure, basically. there's that. There's no question yeah. there's that. Um, but I do think that there is still a decent number of people coming out who are driven there are different, there's different pressures today. There's no question there's different pressures that impact a young practitioner's practice differently than, you know, when I got out of school, it was almost 79, it was 39 years ago. It was a whole different world in terms of the pressures there. Um, but I feel awfully lucky that the ones that I see on a regular basis at Spear Education, I see a lot of young dentists who are really into what they're doing. Um, and I, I don't, now, add a little more to that answer, I tend, well, I don't tend, I don't, um, I just tend to not speak much outside of spear education anymore. I do National Academy meetings, so I'll do the Restorative Academy or the Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry or Cosmetic Dentistry or Fix Pros, or uh, I do those meetings, and that's a, you know, a closed group, basically, but I... I no longer go to really large meetings, um, let's say like a, a nap, typical state dental association meeting. So right. I don't necessarily see who's going to, who's attending those meetings and what, where they're at in terms of their mentality about practice and their mentality about what is it they're trying to do clinically. And so 
So I'm a little biased because I think I get um, I get a filtered group in front of me in Scottsdale. Right. right. Yeah, I yeah think that's- and, and I think that's true. And I think there's that's a good thing that you know, sort of the the focus is you said that you've people show up oftentimes because they associate. Uh, they a lot of times I think know somebody that does know what it's about, and so they associate that with you know I want to be. I want to get what he's got, yeah. you know, type of mentality, which is, which is what you were doing in your residency and what you were doing in dental school through the story you told was, you know, I want to be like this guy. I want to be, you know, I, I'm, I want my case to be the one that's shown, uh, you know, when, when we have the presentation. Uh, I think that what we're seeing, <clears throat> you know, though it, it, it's interesting outside of those closed groups, you know, we saw you at the Academy of Austin Integration as a good example of a meeting that, you know, brings together multiple yeah. specialties to, uh, that really, I think, is doing uh, doing it right from what yeah. Wes and I see, yeah. and we're big fans of that organization. Yeah, it's a great and organization. Ve- yeah, yeah, and and we find it very interesting because there's only about five percent of that organization that's that's GPs, and so it's it's interesting because it seems like there's less overall push toward that maybe outside of maybe the filtered groups. And I think it's, it's becoming uh, more, you know, but, but a good mentor of ours told us, you know, uh, at one point he said, you know, you, you focus on the people that you can help. You focus on the people that uh, are looking for that. You can't necessarily uh, change everything. I, I think the practice philosophy though, that, that you bring, you know, see so you, you, the clinical side that you spoke to that you learn through residency sort of one side of what spear education in general does but there's another side of that that i was interested you know when we first wes and i first went to facially generated treatment planning i was very interested very maybe surprised that the first part of that uh first day was really not at all about yeah, clinical, clinical dentistry <laughs> <laughs> yeah it wasn't at all clinical yeah. and it was refreshing because it was all about the why uh, yeah. and, uh, I want you to maybe talk a little bit about that because when you started getting into, uh, your practice after residency and you were feeling comfortable with complex treatment planning, you had some of this mentorship in place, you had people that pushed you to get better. At what point did you look at your practice and say, this is kind of the philosophy of practice that I want to have was to try to look at the system or to look at the more, I mean, I know this is part of the residency training, but you guys take it a little bit further than that. Yeah. So, um, I'll go back in time again, uh, and just describe my, my, what my practice looked like, uh, when I got out of school. Um, so I, I, I did go right from dental school into the Perio Pross program, and it was I finished everything up in basically just a little less than three years. And then I had been divorced in my last year of grad school, so I needed to work. And um, you know we did have different pressures then. One of the pressures we did have is interest rates were 18 to 19 percent. So you just to get out and do an office and start cold with an 18 to 19% interest rate, I mean, it was it's crazy. too scary. Yeah. Uh, so I needed to work, and I had some good friends that were periodontists, and so I, I practiced um, Monday through Saturday. I practiced six days a week. On Mondays, um, I practiced, I rented space from a, a female periodontist who had been in my, one of my very best friends all through dental school. And then she went through her period training the same time I went through mine. And then she got into practice and she was in a really great area of Seattle. And, um, and so I practiced on Mondays in her office and she had a pretty affluent clientele. And you gotta put this in perspective about your case presentation, imagine this. Every patient I saw, she had already told them what they needed. Mm-hmm. She had even told them roughly what it was probably going to cost. She told them all about me, and then I finally meet them. So <laughs> I used to joke, Mondays was like dental heaven. Yeah, it's like an underhanded pitch. Mon- with the big Mondays, I-, I couldn't, 
they were going to say yes no matter what. Unless I was That's just a right. jerk, they were going to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they were going to write a check for it, too. Um, yep. But That's the problem awesome. with Mondays was she couldn't take patients from her referring dentist. So the only patients mm. I could see were ones where her referring dentist didn't want to treat them. So it was a really limited practice. Fridays and Saturdays, I worked for two periodontists over on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington. And um, their practice was right next to the naval base over there. And it was great because, again, the patients I saw came from them. The patients had been treatment planned. The patients um, knew what they needed, but the patient didn't have money. A lot of mm -hmm. them were Navy personnel or, or families. And so what I learned in Fridays and Saturdays is I learned how to do the presentation in a way where I could basically say, this is what you've been told, and this is true. This is what I deal for you. But let me share with you how we could do it over three or four years. And so it really was where I learned to phase treatment. Because on the Monday practice, I didn't have to phase treatment. They just did it. Well, that left Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays where I wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And the dentist in my small town that I grew up in, he knew I needed to work. And he was a great guy. He's a great operative dentist. And he said to me, look, I know you don't want to come back to the town you grew up in but you need to work. And he says, why don't you come be my associate and you can work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday here. Mm -hmm. Well, he was right, I needed to work. So I went back to that office and I worked Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Let me get, put some perspective on this. He graduated from dental school in 1943. It's now <laughs> <Wow>. 1982. <laughs> He's been there 39 years. He's still uh -huh. mixing amalgam and cheesecloth. He, he, when, I, when I went to work for him initially, he wasn't using disposable needles. Oh, He was my. using needles that you sharpened with a sharpening stone and used That's a wire to awesome, push them. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Love it. Love it. And, That's awesome. And so he gave me everything that I didn't want in dentistry. Mm -hmm. He gave me the six-year-olds, gave me all his emergencies. <laughs> Great. But because he was limited in um, what he knew how to do. He was a great single tooth dentist. I mean, he really did beautiful crown and bridge. He did beautiful amalgams. But he was very limited in what he knew how to do. And a ton of his patients had complex problems. Mm. But they had never in their lives heard about what was possible because he didn't know it was possible. Mm -hmm. And I knew what was possible because I knew how to do it. But I had to marry how do I talk to these people who have never heard any of this before. Mm -hmm. How do I expose them to a concept and make him look good at the same time? Right. That's the that's that's awesome. a huge challenge. And, and that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, <clears throat> that's where I really learned my best presentation skills. Be, because mm. the, other, the other places, those patients were already, they were pre-set up for me. Before I mm -hmm. ever got involved, they, you know, but Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I was seeing patients of his had been with him 10, 15, 20, 25 years um, and didn't simply didn't know what was actually happening in their mouth. So does this make the point where sometimes it's the school of hard knocks and the and the, you know, as you um, I don't like the word evolve, but as you mature as a dentist and you put yourself around these people in your career early on, is that what helped you learn how to communicate? Were there, was that the, um, for lack of a better term, amalgamation of people that, that came together? Yeah, that, that office in the town I grew up in was where I learned my best communication skills by mm -hmm. far. And Interesting. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't going to courses. It wasn't uh, reading books. It was really just uh, putting was, that into practice. And it was, you know, watching how people responded to the different styles of communication. Right. Behavior, understanding behavior, yeah. and just watching that. Yeah. And, Speak to your auxiliaries for just a minute, because you, you, you know, in your career, uh, you've seen dental auxiliaries and you, you've trained them and, and, and I, I can't practice without my dental assistants and, and, just mine today and how she interacts as I'm presenting treatment. I mean, it's, 
it's unbelievable. It's like a marriage and, and, and a words that how they flow. It helps patients understand and get confidence and trust in you. Where did that really start to really click? Because coming out of dental school, even I at the time in 2003 had very little experience working with auxiliaries. Speak to that for just a bit. Yeah, so I, I will say that one of the things that Washington did very well in the 1970s, um, and I can't remember the name for, for it, um, but they, they had a clinic that as a dental student, you actually went in and worked in a clinic with hygienists and assistants, and, and it was a, a several month long thing for you to start learning the skills. And, and it, it, that was my first exposure to the fact that I was gonna need to do this with somebody else. <laughs> I couldn't mm -hmm, just practice right. alone. Um, when I got out and was working out of those different offices, I actually, in the Monday office, I used one of the periodontist assistants. Um, so I didn't have a close relationship there. And on the Friday, Saturday, I used one of the two periodontist assistants. But um, it was really, again, that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday practice where I had my first, if you will, team member that I started to learn how to interact with. And um, I would say, as probably is true for most dentists initially, um, I wasn't necessarily a, an effective leader or communicator to them. Um, part of me kind of assumed if they'd gone to assisting school, they should know <laughs> what to do. And uh, it wasn't until things were starting to not work that I, uh, I really realized that I, I, needed, I needed to start to, to learn how to communicate and how to develop team around me who could see the vision that I saw. And my, my thing, and I think one of the things I'm most proud of right now with what we do at Spear, is we now have a curriculum for dentists and their teams to follow. Um, it's been recently put in place. So literally, uh, if a dentist had a certain topic, a certain clinical topic that they wanted to learn about online, um, we literally give them an entire curriculum and it includes videos for every member of the team. And we give them assignments for every other week. The team now meets and has a discussion about the videos that the hygienist watched, the assistant watched, the front desk watched, the dentist watched on this particular topic. What does it mean to integrate that topic into their practice? Um, but we, I didn't have that, obviously, <laughs> back in the right. 1980s. Um, so I, I learned team, in, again, somewhat through hard knocks. Um, things went bad. And when things, my, my joke has always been when the pain is bad enough, usually you'll do something about it. <laughs> and, and when my, my interaction with team became painful enough, that's when I realized that I had to learn a different style of leadership does, and a different does that, style. Does that mean you're an introvert? Um, <laughs> you know, I've, I've tested out as an extrovert and an introvert in all the Myers-Briggs. At times in my okay. life, I've been a massive extrovert. Right now, yeah. I would test as an introvert. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Interesting. I'll, Interesting, because that, that sounded like almost the classic introvert. Like you say, when the yeah. pain gets bad yeah, enough, right. the conflict yeah. must occur. <laughs> So, uh, so I'm interested to, so that you got to the point then through this experience really of testing and seeing reactions and learning what this treatment acceptance was like and how it worked. What, at what point did you realize that you liked teaching that to people or that you could teach that? Was that through the study club? Was that through just, you know, what, how did that, how did that happen? How did the, how did that progress? So, um, teaching clinical for me was just always a natural. Um, teaching anything non-clinical, that was just a whole different thing. And um, if I was to, I don't, I don't know that I, I used to, 
to talk even in the 80s about how I presented treatment. Because what I learned in that small town practice on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I learned that if I told most of those patients what they should do, they didn't react positively to that style of presentation. If I led them through what I saw and what I thought was going to happen if they didn't do anything, and then if I would say things like, now you don't have to do anything right now, I just want you to know this is what I'm seeing and this is probably where this is going to end up, um, and you probably haven't even heard this before, um, but this, this is kind of what I want you to be aware of this. And if, if you want to talk more about it, or you would like me to get the additional records I need to try and figure out what could be done, I would be happy to do that. But for now, I just want you to know at the exam today, this is kind of what I'm, and, and I'm talking about seeing patients of the dentist who's, they've been seeing him for 10, 15, 20, 25 years. Right, is right. I, when I would try and tell them, um, this is what I think should be done, a lot of times they would get upset with me. It would be, well, he, you know, he's never said that to me. How come I've been seeing him for 10 or 20 years and you're this young kid and he, he, nobody's ever said this before but you? But when I would do it from a different perspective, the perspective of here, uh, let me make you aware of what I'm seeing happen and recognize you don't have to do anything right now. This isn't like urgent stuff most of the time. Um, what, what, what I would discover is a lot of people wouldn't say anything, or they wouldn't say yes, for sure. But it was amazing how many people, uh, six months, 12 months, 18 months, two years later, would come back and go, you know, I've been thinking about that conversation we had. Um, mm. I'd, li I'd like to follow up more with it about yeah. what you think could be done. And it was really, it was me learning through, through doing stuff that didn't work. Yep. And, and discovering that some of the things I was doing um, actually were downright offensive to patients. <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget, I mentioned Saul Schluger, who is the, the head that you know, founded our perio program. And when we were in perio students, he's a legend. And he's like six feet four, and he's elegant, and he wears a perfect shirt and tie and vest and deep voice and perfectly trimmed mustache. And when he would speak, it was like this deep baritone, and it was like, and we're these young kids, and we'd say to him, Dr. Schluger, how do you get patients to do periosurgery? And he would look at us and go, what do you mean? What do you mean, how do you get them to do it? We're like, well, how do you, how do, what do you do that, so they let you do it? He says, I look him in the face and I say, you've got it, I can fix it, $5,000. And they do it. <laughs> And it was like, okay, that's never going to happen. <laughs> yeah, thanks Might a lot. Might happen for him. Yeah, it's never going to happen for me. And, and sure enough, when I tried anything like that, it didn't work that well. Yeah. You talk about that in your book a little bit in chapter, I think it's chapter two, the benefits of co-diagnosis. And, and that, you know, the authoritarian model is what you just described right, right there, which is exactly. the classic, like, you know, patient shows I'm the up. doctor. You're the patient. Yeah, I'm the doctor. You listen to me. Here's the diagnosis. Hey, you got to do this and pay me, you know? And and then you go through a couple of different models, which leads to the co-diagnostic or co-diagnosis -diag model. And uh, speak, and you know. It is interesting, though, how, like you say, six months or 12 months. That's what happens. Or three years. It, it, happen I, it know, happened this week. Yeah, I talked to my fun. associate yeah. about that, you know, when he first worked together. And, you know, there's no, in my opinion, there's there's really no shortcut. You know, you no. don't you don't get busy at the beginning. Nope. And but nope. if you do it right and you're 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 deliberate, it is just kind of crazy how someone you you've kind of forgotten about comes in and says, you know, I, I'm I'm ready to go. Here's here's forty eight thousand dollars. I you and you're like, well, I haven't even gotten records yet. You know, <laughs> right. it's, but it's, two years later, and it's and it's because of things that you know are, are are extremely low pressure. It's just that that model, and it's amazing how that works. Wes, I'm sorry, I interrupted. So why? You. 
Yeah, that's, I mean, that's really what I was leading to is exactly what you just said is that these patients come full circle and it doesn't start out like as like you're going to be just doing this treatment unless you're in a situation where they're just, you know, a periodontist is punting you easy cases. That's not right. That's not practical. And even as you talked about in the story there, that it just doesn't happen that way. And where you learned was in where it is the small town. Uh, dentist office and that's where you learn how to communicate properly with or communicate in a way that you could present these type things now what do you think are some of the primary reasons um, or what are some of the primary reasons you think most dentists struggle with treatment plan acceptance well I think we just talked on one of them is I think that uh, I think that well there's, uh, there's a few things I think the style of how the communication is done, it, it's interesting, um, you know, we obviously, because we're an educational institution, um, we do a lot of research on things like this. So the ADA did a, a research piece that they published in 2012 on why patients don't say yes. Mm-hmm. And um, after polling people, 59% of them said, it. in fact, it was fees. It was the cost. But what's interesting to me, and, and this is, you know, I have a daughter who's been in practice now, she's been going on nine years, and I have a son who's entering dental school this July, um, and my son-in-law, who's married my oldest daughter, is an endodontist, so we have these conversations all the time. Um, what's interesting to me, and this is what I've tried to get my daughter to understand, because the practice she's in, which she owns, has about 65% of She's in network with PPOs. But what, I, what the ADA said is, you know, 59% said no because of cost. But that meant 41% it wasn't cost. Something else prevented them from saying yes. The research we've done at Spear for patients, lay people, where we've hired research organizations to find out why people don't say yes, Um, what's shocking is about 30% of people say it's because of how it's communicated. It's because of how it's presented. And in fact, amazing how many of them said, I went, I left the office, I went to a different office, was presented the same treatment in a different way and did it. And so I think there's the style of communication. When you do the authoritarian thing where you sit down and say, um, you need five crowns, you need this, you need this, and it's $15,000. I don't think that a lot of patients like that presentation style, but I think Mm -hmm. a lot of dentists use that presentation style. If we go back to the why um, that you mentioned, you know, the typical style, the authoritarian model is, I tell you what you need, and then I try and tell you why you need it, which Mm. is so backwards. Yes. Mm. It's so backwards. Let me tell you why, what, what I see... Um, what I think it would be appropriate, this is why it's appropriate, um, would you like to hear more about it, or are you interested in doing it? That's the co-diagnosis model in a nutshell. The other things that I will tell you is I think that some dentists um, believe patients don't want to hear it. And if you believe a patient doesn't want treatment, and you don't believe in the treatment for them, you will communicate that to them. It may not be verbally, <laughs> but you yes. will communicate it to them. And you know what I what I say to students is, uh, confidence is so important. That's it. In how you communicate to a patient, That's you it. need to truly believe honestly that what you're saying is what's right for them, and yep. then it comes out differently. It does. So true. And that's where the clinical education side, I think, really hits hard is, you know, you have you have that's where it has to dovetail. You can't really have one without the other, at least if you want long term success. You know, I think if you're a great salesperson and you understand how to communicate, it does get you a certain distance. But, uh, you know, but then you have. Your clinical yeah. dentistry sucks, yeah. you know, yeah. there comes exactly. a point. You can't <laughs> fake it before you, you make need to it. Move. Exactly. You just gotta, yeah. Yeah, you just gotta yeah. move to the next town and yeah. so uh, you start all over. But I, I think that's where, you know, that that you have to have both. But it seems like it's sort of rare 
to have both presented. And that was wow. why I think I was so taken aback in a good way by the fact that our first uh, workshop experience <laughs> was was about why, why are you here? You know, what are you doing here? You know, because uh, if you don't understand that, and, and I thought too, you know, the, the question that, I, and of course Gary asked it when we took it, he said, well, how much is enough? You know, what's enough for you? You know, at what point, uh, what, what are you trying to get from the educational experience? And I, I love that because I think it, it really centers you back to the idea of what this is kind of all about and that the clinical side does lead to being busy if you do it yeah. right, but you have to have the commu- you have to have the communication along with it. I, you know, I, I think too that, you know, Wes and I, as we, as we talked about, uh, you know, you mentioned perioprost, and I, I think it's just interesting. I feel like a lot of Wes and I were having this conversation the other day that we feel like with the way that especially implant dentistry is changing, that a lot of general dentists in a way are being forced, if that's not the right word, that sounds like it's a bad thing, but you really need to be trained almost in that discipline of the perioprost, not so much the periosurgery side, but understanding a lot of these same things. I find it's interesting that those programs are not uh, as ubiquitous as they once well, were. Um, so interesting you say that. Um, I did that program not because I ever wanted to practice perio. I did that program only because I wanted the knowledge base of perio because I knew what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a great restorative dentist. That was what I wanted yeah. to be. I never wanted to go out and be do perio. Um, and just an interesting background for you. The reason those programs don't exist anymore is because in 1983, the ADA said they can't exist. Hmm. Ah. So the ADA back prior to 83, I think it was 80, 82 or 83, um, like the University of Pennsylvania, their perioprost program, you, you got out with a, pro, or a perio certificate. Um, our perioprost program, you got out with a prost certificate. And I'm not sure about Penn, but us, Washington for sure back then had a separate prost program. And the separate mm-hmm. PROS program did maxillofacial, removable, some fixed, but no perio. And the ADA came along and said, no, we're not, we're not going to allow you to separate PROS programs. You have to put all of them together, and you're going to have to drop the perio. And so that happened uh, actually to all the perio PROS programs that existed back then. I just um, think it's so interesting because it seems like that's the big hole in the training is, yeah, is that area where you don't necessarily, as you say, have to go into perio. But you need to understand you need the, the knowledge tissue. base. Yeah. Well, it I, seems I like every. Back, yeah, I was just going to say I want to go back to something you asked me earlier because I, I just realized there's an important part of the answer I think that I didn't share. You asked me about when I started teaching the behavioral yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, and I and I told you I you know when the pain's bad enough. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> right. <laughs> so in in 1989. I was so frustrated with part of my team that I hired a psychologist. Nice. Wow. To come in and do a two day retreat with us. We went to the mountains. <laughs> I'm wow. just imagining we did, this. We went to the morning mountains. huddle. <laughs> we that's, a, that's a show title right there, doctor. <laughs> yeah. We went to the mountains. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and. And we literally did a two-day retreat with him facilitating, you know, it was amazing what came out of it. And then he came back and he would do a half a day every month. So it, that was the turnaround for me in terms of the, the team starting to work together. In 95, because I stayed in that, I stayed in my small town. What, the dentist that I was associated with, he finally retired in 85. I stayed in that office, um, and John Coyce had gone to Washington's Perioprost program a year behind me. John and I had become good friends, and so John went into the Air Force when he got done, and in 85, John was free to leave the Air Force, so John moved to the small town I grew up in, and he and I took over that office together. And 
and we stayed in that office. Um, I finally decided to move to Seattle because I had been living in Seattle and I was driving over an hour each way. So in 95, I moved to a new office in Seattle. But the first time I ever taught the behavioral on a big scale was I moved to my new office in March of 95. And there was a dentist from Vancouver, Canada named Bud Sipko. And Bud was just a great guy. Um, and Bud was, Selection Research Incorporated was the company Bud used to work for. And it was all behavioral practice management. It was a really, it was an incredible company. And he was the uh, program chairman for the American Academy of Practice Management, their meeting in March of 95. And Bud said to me, would you come do a half day for the American Academy of Practice Management totally non-clinical on the behavioral things you've learned to get from when you got out of school to where you are today. So I did, it was in New Orleans, I did this three hours totally non-clinical for that program. And for the next 10 years, because they recorded it on cassettes back then, um, for the next 10 years, I used to get letters I got more feedback for those three hours than any program I had ever done. That's and it was all, it was totally the behavioral aspect of what had happened to me to, to allow me to do the clinical dentistry that I knew how to do. But I had to finally get to a place where the rest of the team was on board with it. See, I think, let me kind of bring it home here because we want to be respectful of time. And I'm having a great time, but um, one thing that I would like for you to talk a little bit about is that I've been thinking here, sitting here talking, we're talking about personality and we're, and how do we change our personality to better communicate? I mean, you hired a psychologist in 1989 to help change the personality of your team. And I, and I, and I think that that's one of the reasons why those cassette tapes were so popular and probably would be, and you know, you could listen to them today and they'd be applicable to, you know, what we're trying to, to achieve as dentists to get our patients to say yes to treatment or just better communication amongst your team and employees that you work with. So I wonder if you could give us maybe, and I'll change this up on you just a little bit and kind of, we'll finish out the show this way is three things to help mold your personality into a great communicator. I know that's going to be hard, but um, is there three things that you could kind of share with us about personality and how, how better to communicate with our patients and team? Um, I don't know. I don't know that I'm going to describe what I'm going to say as a way of altering your personality, but it could be that that's how it's going to come out. Um, let, I'll share a story with you that I think is very applicable to communicating with patients. It, it's not a patient communication story. It's a different story. Um, so when I did my very first national lecture in uh, February, I can tell you the exact day, February 20th, 1983 in Chicago. And it was on this American Academy of Fixed Pros meeting. And um, it was, you know, for me at the time, it was huge. They had like 700 people in the audience. And it was like people that I'd viewed as legends were the other five speakers uh, on this day. And the first speaker was um, Vic Lucia, who invented the Lucia jig. <laughs> and the title of his presentation was um, A 30-Year Retrospective on Prostodonics. Oh, man. Those guys. <laughs> and It's amazing. It's amazing. I'm, I'm supposed to come up, and I've now been out of grad school <laughs> not even a year. Yeah. I guess ba barely a year. And the reason I remember the date so well is... Um, it was the day before my 30th birthday. Oh, man. So I was 29 mm. years old. Mm. And so the night before this meeting, I am so 
shook. I've got my slide carousels, my left and right slide carousels, and I'm sitting in my hotel room with my wife and the carousels are on the bed and I'm picking up the left and right slides and then putting them back in. Next one, reviewing my presentation this way. Wow. And I get so nervous, I dumped an entire carousel over. Oh, oh no. It's a bad day. And um, I finally got it all put back together. And my wife said to me, you know, education is not a performance. Education's an act of love. Put your carousels away, you'll be fine. And when I interact with a student or a patient, I am very intentional in that I want to influence their lives in the most positive way that works for them. Not that works for me, but that works for them. And so I always try and keep in mind when I'm talking to a student or if I'm presenting to a patient, <clears throat> um, let me share with you, and, and I'm going to kind of, you know, for me, it's a little bit formulaic, but it's literally, let me share with you what I see so you're aware of what I see. Let me share with you what I believe are the consequences of doing nothing to what I, the, what I just shared with you. Let me share with you what I believe the benefits of treatment would be. And then you can decide whether it's something you have an interest in pursuing or not. Because I'm, I'm not you. But it goes back to having a certain level of respect for their giving them the option to say no in a way that is, it's fine. No is fine. If this doesn't work for you in your life right now, I just want you to be aware of it. Be aware of it, know the consequences, know the benefits. If you want to know, if you, if you want to go farther and talk about it, then I can talk to you about what we could actually do and what it would cost and things like that. But for me, it, all, it goes back to that, literally that lecture and being respectful about my role is to help influence people's lives in a way that works for them because I'm not them. So I can only put out there what I believe is, is right, and then they're going to decide whether it works for them or not. So I, I think, and I don't know how to describe that, but I think that would be one of the key personality traits. Um, and you know, as I was talking, I, I mentioned those Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays back in the 1980s. Um, what I learned in that office, when, when I was still the associate, when the dentist who'd been there, you know, 39, 40, 41, 42 years, when he was still there, what I learned to say to his patients was something really similar. Mm. I literally, it was a five-step process, and I learned if I did those five steps to all of his patients, I could usually inform them what I saw, and they still loved him. Mm. And so the That's first awesome. the first step, and, and I tell dentists today, um, it's the same conversation you need to have with your own patients if they've been with you five or ten years. Mm. And, and as you learn and grow and you do CE, you are going to start to see things you didn't see before, and you're going to have your own patients sitting in front of you, and you're going to go, wow, how do I bring this up? <laughs> right. I, I haven't talked to them about this before. And now I actually see I could help them, but mm -hmm. man, it's going to look bad because I haven't said anything before. So uh, the steps I learned as that associate was number one, you have to start with something positive. Mm. Good. And, and what I would tell his patients, the dentist I was the associate for, I would literally say to them, you are so lucky to have Dr. Scott as your dentist. I have looked at your record and you've been his patient 20 years. Your gums are healthy as can be. You haven't lost a single tooth. You are just really lucky to have someone who cares as much as he does. The second thing I would do, I would say to him, you know, you've been my patient. And by the way, when it's your own patient, it's hard to say that. You're right. so lucky to have me as your dentist. <laughs> you might want to omit that part. Um, yeah. but, but you still say something positive, you know. Yeah, yeah. Second thing, people don't realize teeth wear out. 
And so I would mm. say to them, you know, you've been Dr. Scott's patient 20 years. Your teeth today, when I see you, your teeth aren't the same teeth you walked in here with 20 years ago. And so your mouth has changed in 20 years. And, you know, it's probably been slow and gradual, but now that I'm seeing you at this stage, first day I've ever met you, um, there's stuff that I see that probably wasn't there even 10 years ago, the way it is now. And the good news is, third thing, dentistry has really changed. And we can treat things really conservatively, and we can do it in different ways with different techniques and materials. So we've got the fact that overall things are really good, your mouth is changing, dentistry is changing, and then what you tell your existing patients is, as a dentist, guess what? I am trying to be the best dentist I can be. So I'm doing CE, and I am working on being excellent. And I am a better dentist today than I was a year ago. And I'm a better dentist then than I was two years before that. So your mouth's been changing, dentistry's been changing, and I've been changing. And I really would like to have a conversation with you about stuff we've never talked about before. Mm. And that's what I would say to his patients. I would like to have a conversation with you with stuff that my guess is Dr. Scott's never talked to you about before. And then I would just not go into heavy treatment plan, cost, anything else. Just let me share with you a little bit of what I see. Um, and then I might show them a before and after picture of somebody who, have, let's say it's a wear case. And here they were before. And, and you know what? This is kind of like what your teeth are like. And here's what they look like afterwards. You don't have to do anything today. I just want you to know this is kind of what I see happening. And if you ever want to have this conversation and learn more about what we could do, I would be happy to have that conversation with you. Um, and to me, that was how I started approaching his patients that had really complex problems. And that's by approaching them that way, they never got upset with me. Because I never said anything about, why didn't Dr. Scott say this to you? He was a bad right. dentist, he's whatever. It's like, no, mm -hmm. you know, you've been here a long time. And, and this is kind of what I'm seeing happen. Um, so anyway. That's well, good. it's amazing to me that, you know, that some of the most effective communication skills in this area are not confrontational, really. Right. You know, and, and I mean, you know, the, you would, I think that um, if you're not in a sales world, um, you don't, you, you think that sales is by nature, a, a pressure right. sport, you know, and it's all about pressure, man. And, you know, there's a lot of people teaching that yeah, in dentistry as well. As well. Yeah. And, uh, but again, it, it just blows my mind sometimes to, you know, you mentioned the patients who say no, and, you know, some of the no patients are some of my best patients, you know, they're, they're not, they're not ready yet. Yeah, but that's they exactly. But but they own it. They they know. They say, yeah, you know, I know we talked about that. So yeah, I broke another tooth, and well, let's fix that. I know I've got this problem. It's not ready yet, and I love that. You know, it's it's changed the way that I that my day goes from. Well, it, it takes a lot of stress out of it. <clears throat> yeah, it does. because when it emergencies does. come in, not every time, but a significant amount of the time, they knew. They know why they're there, you know, right. and uh, they say, yeah, I know we talked about this. I'm not, I'm not quite ready to do that, but I'm ready to fix this. And uh, all of a sudden you don't have these crazy emergencies where you're, you know, you don't know what you're going to do next. And it's such a right. beautiful thing. And it's not a confrontational thing, which, again, you talk about personality, even for a lot of dentists, who I think there's a lot of introverts out there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, for are, sure. Yeah. And, and they're really not great at confrontation. And this approach is, is beautiful. For even the most introverted personality type, you don't have to change that. You can just, like you say, it's all about having that love for the patient and the respect for them that they're going to fit it into their life when the time's right. And I, and I believe, you know what, patients feel that. And when you treat people well like that, they they tend to treat you the same way in return. Not, not all, <laughs> but <laughs> <Right>. most. <laughs> no. yeah, most, not. most don't take advantage of it. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, let's wrap it up with this because we've referred to the book uh, and what book are we talking about and that's the book case acceptance in the modern dental practice and uh, this was just recently released and tell us a little bit about the book and uh, there's um, I mean you wrote the book with uh, um, a gentleman here that I don't know about but let's talk a little bit about um, 
the book and um, and then we'll kind of close the show out. Yeah, so um, Adam McWethy, who mm -hmm. is uh, with us at Spear and, and has a, a tremendous background actual in behavioral knowledge, mm -hmm. behavioral science. He approached me about a year ago and he said, you know, he said, it, what's obvious as he had gotten more and more involved in our curriculum and with our students, he realized that case acceptance and communication was just a, a significant problem for dentists. And he said, what I see is the problem is, number one, you're not trained in that arena. And he said, you know, there's a lot of research, a lot of research on the behavioral aspects of communication um, that exist, not maybe in dentistry, but they're the same. It's the, whether you're communicating in dentistry or communicating outside of dentistry, it's the same. And he said, what I would love to do is to consider doing something together where you take your history um, of experiences, if you will, from practice, and we marry what you've experienced with different patients and you know your what you went through going back almost 40 years and we marry that with science of communication and behavior and so it became a collaborative effort where he would start to write up a segment of the book on some of the research and then I would read it and go oh I I got that I got a patient exactly like that who that fits perfectly um, and so I would then grab my clinical stuff and I would write the part about that patient and what my clinical experience was with, with presenting to that person. Um, and some of it's funny, some of it's painful, some of it's very positive. Um, and so it was a back and forth. But what I really like about what Adam did is if you read all the way through and you look at his decision tree process, you realize there's just so many things we don't think about that a patient's experiencing when they're sitting across from us. And it could be the time of day. It could be the day of the week. It could be their need to get to their kid's soccer practice. It could. There's so many different things that research really looks at, um, and there's a good research basis for. And so what we tried to do was marry the research and the clinical um, into something that people can read and I think it gives you a different perspective on who's sitting across from you and why some of them behave the way they do um, and why you might want to invite some of them back at a different time or a more appropriate time, why some of them say no, why some say yes. Um, so it was, it was about a year-long process to, to end up putting the whole thing together, but I, I'm very pleased with how it turned out. Well, I'm I, super I, excited I, to see. And I think uh, it's interesting, you know, I, 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 I think that, I think one thing I keep hearing coming up in this as we're talking is stories. Yeah. You know, stories. And every time we ask a question, I love it. It's called you know, wisdom. I've got, a, I've got a story. I've got a story. It's called wisdom. And I just imagine you and Adam sitting down and having those discussions and Adam saying, here's the, let me give you the behavioral research. Ah, I've got a story for that. And right. I, and I feel like maybe some of what, you're teaching really is storytelling. It's storytelling to patients. It's giving them the story of their dental situation. And it's almost a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's even three parts that sort of get, get uh, presented in the way that you talk. I feel like that's, you, you know, interesting thing about storytelling is you can learn to be a better storyteller. You know, and I feel like that's some of what we're learning through Spear Education. Do you think there's any truth to that? Oh, for sure. I, I think great education has a lot to do with storytelling. And, and when you communicate with a patient, you're basically being an educator. You know? Um, That's awesome. You, you're, you're doing the same thing. So, Well, I'll tell you what. Um, this has been an amazing um, talk, and I wish that we could just keep going on and on. John and I could talk we would. for hours. Yeah. We would, <laughs> and we would, <laughs> but I just want to say this. Thank you so much uh, to Spear Education uh, One um, and the man behind Spear Education, Dr. Frank Spear. Thank you so much for coming on The Dental Guys, and uh, this is really um, 
we really appreciate it, humbled by it, mm-hmm. um, because of what you've done for our career as as general dentist. Uh, John and I um, made decisions a few years ago uh, to dive in and dive it in deep, and uh, we appreciate uh, you coming on our show and talking a little bit about what's made. Um, you know, made your career um, with, you know, talking to patients amazing and and really sharing with us some of your passions. I think one of the things before I go is I want to make our users aware of a couple things. Um, if you want to get access to this book, one of the best ways that you can kind of get plugged into Spear Education is to go to the link in the description below. And if you click that link, you'll go to the Dental Guys landing page at Spear Education and receive $20 off a month for the online uh, Spear Education environment. Now, what that, uh, from what I've been told, is that you can download a copy of that book for free, uh, a digital yeah. version. Now, it's also available on Amazon. Uh, just like everything else, buy it now. Uh, so if you want to get a hard copy of that book, just like I have here. A drone may deliver it to your home. A, a drone may deliver it to your home. If you're on the YouTube version right now or on the, I don't know, but mine is signed oh, uh, by goodness. Dr. Careful. Frank Spear. So thank you so much for that. Um, I appreciate the appreciate that. A uh, little geekery there for, for <laughs> my nightstand. Um, <laughs> but, uh, we really appreciate, uh, Dr. Spear. Thank you so much for coming on our show, John, any parting words and, uh, and I'll give uh, Dr. Spear the last words too. Yeah. Thank you uh, once again, uh, for the Spear education, Dr. Spear. It's been a pleasure, uh, speaking with you and, uh, we look forward to, uh, uh continuing to uh, learn more from you and from, uh, we're actually coming out, uh, the next workshop mm. we have we're going to be Junior interviewing warren dentition uh, mm. yeah warren dentition and we're going to be uh, interviewing darren darren uh, deister, deister once he's one again. of our favorites and, uh, john he's, he's going to be we're going to geek out with darren about you know guy. if you were oh, like yeah. to like okay so here's dr spear you know and it's like <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah I'm he's a close second but it's he's a still, close yeah, second you know but but so. we're going to be geeking out with darren about uh some really cool uh full fixed or fixed removable implant restorations very interesting but it, but we're uh, you know we're excited to be a part of kind of the spear world a little bit through yeah, this kind of you. thing. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. Well, it's it's been a pleasure getting to spend time with both of you, John and Wes, and I've enjoyed it. I I wasn't sure exactly what to expect. I can tell you, I would actually even do it again. So I've had a good time. Oh, thank so. you so much. That's <laughs> a compliment. That's awesome. And I'll oh, look forward awesome. to uh, to seeing you in Scottsdale. I also wanted to acknowledge, you know, what you guys are doing. Um, it's just the world we live in in dentistry today, so much of it is online. And, you know, we're really proud of our online education site. Um, but what you're doing to make people aware of different things that are out there, um, it's just it's so much the future of, of where dentistry is headed that uh, mm. I, I commend you both. And uh, I'll look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you so much. Excellent. Well, Wes um, and our <laughs> listeners, man, I mean, that that was pretty amazing, amazing. Uh, interview. We had a great time, <clears throat> first of all, getting to do that. Again, thanks to Dr. Spear and also to Spear Education for the opportunity. You know, one of the things that I, I thought, yeah, I thought was uh, uh, really interesting from, from that, you know, was the storytelling aspect, you know, that really a lot of what uh, Dr. Spear knows how to do is he knows how to tell a great story that is not about him, but it's about the patient. I feel like that's a lot of what we do. And that's what, the more I heard him speak, the more I thought, huh, that's really, it's more what he's teaching. He's teaching us how to become better storytellers. So what did you, you know, for you, Wes, <clears throat> you know, what was the thing that you took from that as far as just a quick reaction? Man, how in the world can I even do that? Yeah, like, I mean, what, I mean, you, well, you know, we've talked for 15 minutes or 30 minutes here about my I reaction. Know, even before to this. this, it's there's so much to it. I mean, there's a lot of meat in background. here. And I think that I'll have to go back and listen to this time and time again um, to really get it all. But yeah. so we well, want you guys, though, to be able to have access to some of the things that we talked about. First of all, of course, we know, and, mm-hmm. and you guys know, I mean, we, we don't get you get any money from Spear or anything like that, yeah. you know, we, we're just glad to be in orbit with them, essentially, that we're in the same <laughs> galaxy, you know, right. we're just a little planet orbiting around and they happen to be in there. Right. So, 
Thanks for that. But, but, you know, we do want you to know about some of the resources that they offer because we think they're good. Yeah. And that's why we talk about them. Not because we we're on the payroll, but just because they're good. Yeah. We're not on and the payroll so, over spirit education. <clears throat> We'd enjoy, um, being part of that faculty, uh, sometime and maybe, maybe, in the <laughs> right, maybe one day, right? right? Maybe one day. So <laughs> if we play our cards, but right. listen to this is that I learned and it reinforced in my mind that, um, I need to remain humble. Mm. I need to remain hungry, meaning I want to always learn more. And I've learned a lot from this, just this podcast. And I want to remain smart. Now, smart, not like you would think smart, John, but smart interpersonal skills, how to mm. communicate properly. And mm-hmm. I learned a lot about communication this evening, talking to Dr. Spear. Uh, there's a great book that you can get right now. Yep. And I want to plug that book uh, for you. In the description below, you'll see a link for case acceptance in the modern dental practice. And um, this is the book that we referred to a couple times during the show. It's a new book. You can get it there on the Amazon link. If you're a member of the Spear Online community, meaning you subscribe monthly to the online resources there, it's a free download for you. So you can go there and log in, and I'm sure there'll be a link right there. Um, also for, um, if you're a non-member, if you're not a member of the Spear Online, uh, uh, group, then what are you waiting for? Because here's the deal. First of all, yeah, because here's the deal with, uh, the link in the description below, you can go to our landing page there. And if you enter the code really anywhere on the website, the code is T as in the D as in dental, as in G Guys, the dental guys, TDG, TDG 169. That means you're going to get $20 off a month um, for your online subscription just for our listeners. And we appreciate Spear extending that discount to our listeners. Um, and just again, John, we want to thank Dr. Frank Spear for joining us and really the people behind the scenes that put this together and made it happen, Ben and Jen. And yep. we really appreciate them. And John, I'll give you the last word. Plug plug our socials. Yeah, I, I, you know this to to us. This is kind of kind a, of a land. It's kind of a landmark interview zip. for our show. If you like the direction that our show is going, and I hope <laughs> after listening to this, that no, you, no, I don't, John. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you don't. Then I mean unsubscribe, I don't know. like unsubscribe. I, yeah, then just send us hate mail and tell right. us you hate us. I, I can't. I don't know what to say to that. But but if you like the direction this is going with some of these, and, and and we're excited about it. I think you are too. If you're listening to this show and you got anything from it, give us some feedback on that. You know, tell us what you want to hear more uh, about. Tell us about what type of guests you want us to have on the show. Tell us what topics. You know, we're not a very much an interview based show, but you know. This was this. We're always gonna be happy to, well, to interview people like. We'll this. interview Dr. Spear anytime. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but if you if you enjoyed this show and you got something out of it, please give us a, a review on Apple Podcasts, uh, formerly known as, uh, as iTunes Podcasts. <laughs> uh, give us uh, a, a positive uh, review on Facebook. Uh, hit us up on the Twitter. And uh, unlike Elon Musk, we did not delete uh, our, our Twitter Facebook page. and Facebook. Uh, but give us uh, give us some positive feedback. We really want to know. Uh, what you think, give us some, some suggestions of things we can do to improve, but that helps other people to get connected with us. And that's really what it's all about. It's connecting people to good information. Hopefully that's what we're uh, giving to you guys. So we just want to make sure you, uh, you continue the conversation about the dental guys with people that you know and trust, because we're going to continue to be committed to bringing you this kind of high quality content on a consistent basis like you've been expecting from us. we got a lot more coming up from Spear Education, including some interviews uh, just the next few weeks uh, where we're going to really geek out, really geek out, including Brad the Dental Lab guy. Brad the Dental Lab guy at Spear Education. In the same room with a Spear Education faculty member geeking out about lab techniques. So... I know that right now you're just like, you're freaking out over that. So it's coming. It's coming. But give us some feedback. Once again, thank you for being a loyal listener to The Dental Guys. For Wes, I am John, and we are The Dental Guys. 